I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and meet and to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Professor Brian Nosek, co-founder and director, Centre for Open Science, members of the University Senior Management Group, UQ colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely pleased to be able to welcome a person of Professor Nozick's experience to UQ for today's public seminar. Professor Nozick is, as many of you may know, the co-founder and director of the Centre for Open Science. The Centre's overriding mission is to increase transparency, integrity, and reproducibility of our scholarly research. Famously, in 2011, our guest and his collaborators embarked on an ambitious project. Brian and 269 other psychologists set about reproducing 100 psychological experiments. They published their findings four years later in 2015 and demonstrated that only 36 of those 100 experiments showed any statistically significant results. This compared with 97 of the original 100 experiments that claimed significant results. Effectively, some 61 of those 100 studies were called into question. But even more serious than that, some of the replicated experiments suggested effects in the opposite direction to the original published research. Now, there are many reasons that a particular experimental result may not have been reproduced. However, it does give pause for consideration of the biases that both researchers and journals have towards producing and reporting positive findings. Brian's no doubt going to expand upon this particular point later. Humans highly value truth and trust, and these are attributes demanded of us by the community as academics and scientists. We have a duty to the end users of our research to maintain the confidence of both the public and the research community in our peer-reviewed research. FAIR, FAIR data, is an acronym which stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight that some of the approaches UQ has taken recently and continues to undertake are consistent with the FAIR agenda. UQ's policy identifies that research data is a valuable resource that can facilitate innovation and creation of new knowledge, but, is only, but only if there is appropriate management of the data. That means consideration of planning, storing, analysing, curating, describing, preserving, and sharing the data through its, through, through its full life cycle. The more we abide by fair data principles, the greater chances of reproducibility, reliability, and most importantly, public confidence. Within UQ's strategic plan is an important reference that this institution aims to positively influence society through the creation and preservation of knowledge. UQ is committed to the values of accountability and integrity to ensure responsible steward stewardship of these university resources. The university abides by the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research to provide facilities for the safe and secure storage of research data and records where, and records where it is stored. Researchers are required by the same code to manage research data they collect in line with best practice. So in effect, research data is recognised by UQ as a strategic asset. It is a strategic asset which needs to be managed to maximise value, not only for researchers who produced it and this university, but predominantly for broader society. This university is committed to adopting and pioneering the highest standards of research, research excellence in data management. It is a matter of some pride that the European Commission report turning fair into reality cites UQ's research data management system as an exemplar of great practice. 
The system is designed to facilitate sharing, but also safeguards against unwanted open publication of research data sets. This approach ensures data quality sharing while recognising premature sharing may compromise the study itself, the interests of the researcher and or the interests of the university. When the reproducibility project conducted by Brian and his collaborators concluded, they made an important observation. They commented, and I quote, any temptation to interpret these results as a, as a defeat for psychology or science more generally must contend with the fact that this project demonstrates science behaving as it should in a self-correcting manner. Science is about being constantly skeptical of previous claims and always striving for improvement. The fact that a large number of scientists volunteered their time for what was essentially a form of self-awareness and self-correction is extremely heartening. This project reminds us not only to be, not only not to be afraid to admit our mistakes, but also it's okay to identify our possible shortcomings. There's something in that for all of us as individual researchers. And on that note, there is no better time to welcome Brian to the stage. Please give him a warm round of applause. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, thank you to Jason and the team for coordinating my visit, and thanks for uh, coming this evening. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to be able to present to you tonight. Uh, and my laboratory's research interest is in the gap between values and practices, what we think we should do, what we're trying to do, what we want to do in our everyday behavior versus what we actually do and what accounts for the gap when sometimes we do things that are counter uh, to our intentions or values or goals. And most of the work that we have done uh, in sort of trying to understand this in ordinary human behavior is how we may have biases that occur outside of our awareness or control that may shape our everyday behavior in ways that are counter to our intentions, and how the culture around us provides some constraints, some demands, some uh, ways that might shape our behavior that are different than what we might value or what we might hope for. So what I want to talk about tonight is a practical application of that research interest, which is the gap between scientific values and practices. I don't know if the echo here, we might try to lower this mic or something. Uh, and so that's really what the Center for Open Science is founded on, is trying to maximize the extent to which we can identify where there are gaps between our values and our everyday practices, and how do we address those gaps uh, with different tools and resources to shift the culture towards one that embraces greater openness and reproducibility. So let me start with talking about what are the values of science. And a way that we can uh, consider that first is through Robert Merton's norms of science. Robert Merton was a sociologist who identified what he thought are the core ways in which Science is unique uh, or important as a way of knowing or understanding how the world works. And so he identified what he considered the four uh, norms of science. One, communality, the open sharing of information. When I make a scientific claim, it doesn't gain credibility because I say, please just trust me. Uh, it gains credibility based on your ability to review the evidence that's the basis of that claim. What's the methodology that I used to generate some data? What data did get generated? How did I draw inference uh, from that data to arrive at the claims that I now say you should uh, take seriously? As opposed to the counter norm, secrecy. Nope, just got to trust me. Believe me, I, I figured this out. Just trust me. A second norm is universalism. Research is evaluated based on its own merit, right? The data itself, the process itself is the basis for deciding whether it's a credible claim or not versus the counter norm. That's a famous person. All right, let's trust it because they must know what they're talking about. Right, the third is disinterestedness. Researchers are motivated by knowledge and discovery, just trying to figure it out, versus the counter norm of self-interestedness. Really, I'm here to do more and get more ahead of my colleagues and try to advance my career uh, more than they are able to advance theirs. Right? 
Fourth norm of organized skepticism. A researcher considers all the new evidence, even that that's against their prior work or claims, versus organized dogmatism. What I do is I get dissertation findings, and then I spend the rest of my career combating all of the attackers to try to preserve the integrity of those original claims. And while Merton didn't talk about it, a number of uh, observers of science have talked about the norm of quality over the norm of quantity. So we might recognize this as a list, uh, and there's other related ones that other philosophers of science have identified, as ways in which science uh, might try to accumulate knowledge. But an obvious question is whether researchers themselves endorse it. Do they think that we should behave according to these norms of science, or do they endorse the counter norms? And Anderson and her colleagues decided to ask. So they did a survey of about 3,300 NIH awardees. In this case, early career refers to researchers that were in postdoctoral awards from NIH, and mid-career are researchers who had their first R01 award, so average age in that sample of around 40. And they just asked, which one do you endorse, the norm or the counter norm? And what you're seeing here is the cumulative plot of proportion of people in gray who endorsed the norms over the counter norms on average. About 90% of participants did so. In black are those that endorse the counter norms over the norms. So they said we should treat it as a competition. I do want to keep it all secret. Very, very few people endorse the counter norms over the norms. And then the gray hatches are those that said, well, both of these I endorse about equal weight uh, for how science should operate. So then they said, great, thank you. That's what you endorse. Don't tell me what you endorse, what you think should happen. Tell me how you do behave in your research. And it looks like this. So about 60% of people say, I still I behave according to the norms of science, but a much, smaller, uh, much larger proportion of people are acknowledging that those counter norms have some weight on their behavior. And still very, very few are saying that they behave according to the counter norms over the norms. So then they said, OK, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Tell, now don't tell me what you do. Tell me what everybody else in your research area, what do they do? And it looks like this. So this is a remarkable because everyone themselves is endorsing the norms of science. We are individually largely feeling like we behave according to those norms. But we do not perceive the rest of us, which are us that just answered the survey, to be behaving by those norms. And so this illustrates a massive gap between what it is we value individually and collectively and what we perceive the culture of science to value and reward. That really, what we have are principles that we aspire to and realities of how it is we advance in our career. And so as a consequence, we put individual researchers in a very difficult position. How is it that I advance my career? And I have a choice to make according to these perceptions, which is I could live in science according to my values, open sharing, communicate everything, be skeptical of my own work, at the potential cost of advancing my career. Or I could say, I need a career, so I'm going to do what it takes. Those counter norms will advance me even at the cost of living according to my values. And that isn't a situation that is a healthy situation for any culture. If our values are misaligned with what we're actually incentivizing and rewarding in practice, then we may interfere with the whole goal of science in the first place, accelerating discovery, figuring out knowledge, solutions and cures. And so what is the core challenge? Well, we think that there are lots of challenges, but it boils down to this as the central challenge, which is the incentives for my success, advancing my career, are focused on me getting it published, not on me getting it right. If I publish a lot and I publish in the most prestigious outlets that I can, I am more likely to get the next reward, the next job, tenure in my job, good career prospects, good grants, and then more of the rewards because of that. And of course, I want to get it right. I didn't get into science because I like writing papers and writing grants. I got into science because I'm curious. I like figuring things out. I like the problems that I'm studying. I want to contribute some knowledge uh, to the world, very conceptually aspirational goals. And yet, there are realities, concrete realities, of what it takes to be rewarded and advanced in scholarship. And we know that not everything that we do gets published. So I might work very hard and produce lots of evidence, 
but some kinds of evidence is more publishable than other kinds of evidence. Right? I'm more likely to get published by finding a positive result. These, this treatment is effective on this outcome. These two things are related to one another. Then a negative result. Nothing to see here. Right? I'm more likely to get published by finding something novel that hasn't been claimed previously as compared to here's a replication of something that somebody else has claimed. I'm adding some precision, but it's the same thing as before. And I'm more likely to get published if I have evidence that sort of makes for a neat and tidy story where it all fits together and the claim is clear and the evidence supporting the claim is all consistent. As opposed to things that have exceptions, things that don't quite fit, uncertainties, an explanation that doesn't quite account for all of it. So a positive, novel, tidy story is the best kind of story in science because it is the best kind of story. If you're able to find out something new, explain it clearly, and have all the evidence fit together, you have made an amazing contribution to science and sent it in new directions. The problem, of course, is that reality doesn't look like that very often. Right? When we're in the lab doing research, there's lots of exceptions, lots of false starts, lots of things that don't make sense, things that don't fit together, lots of negative findings. And that's because we're studying things we don't understand. That's why we study them. And so the emergence of understanding, the emergence of that clean and tidy story that's well backed by evidence is a slow emergence. Happens over many research projects, over lots of time, trying to figure out what the right narrative understanding is for this thing that we are studying. But of course, the incentive system doesn't work like that. It's every paper needs to be positive, novel, and tidy in order to maximize our rewards. And so with that, then, comes a conflict of interest. I need certain kinds of outcomes in order to advance my career. But to get those outcomes, I might need to do things that maximize their publishability at the potential cost of the credibility of those claims. And we know that because we have lots of discretion in how it is we do our research, that there is lots of opportunity for me, whether I intend to or not, to exploit flex that flexibility and improve publishability at the cost of credibility. And that occurs at every stage of the research process where we might ex exploit those, that flexibility in order to improve our chances for publication. For example, once I have data and I've been looking at it in multiple ways, trying to make sense of that data, some of those ways might make the finding more publishable than other ways of analyzing that data. And it's possible that without recognizing, I might rationalize that in fact the way that looks better for publication is the, in fact the right way to analyze that data as opposed to the alternative way that's less publishable. Likewise, we do lots of experiments in the lab. We don't publish all of them. What is the selection process to decide that this one belongs in the paper and that one does not? Is there any selection bias where if we get a negative result, we're more likely to say, well, we screwed up the methodology in that one. That doesn't actually account for the thing that we were trying to study, so we can put that one aside. And the one that found the positive result, well, that's the one that we should be including in the paper as the next figure. Right. All of those potential decisions may maximize publication possibility, but because of the selective reporting the selective choices that we make, we may cost the credibility. So there's lots of examples that we could describe. I'm just going to give a couple of illustrations just to show how it is these might manifest uh, in practice in different ways. This is a project that we did where we recruited 29 different teams to study the same question. And the question in this case was, are players with darker skin tone more likely to get red cards in soccer than players with lighter skin tone? And what you're seeing in the circles are each team's effect size estimate of, their, of what they found uh, in their research. The box around it is a 95% confidence interval. So if that confidence interval overlaps with the dark line, uh, we would consider that a null result. There's no relationship between these variables that could be detected, rejecting with standard null hypothesis significance testing. Uh, and what you see is that about a third of the teams, those in gray, uh, are null results by that standard. Whereas about two thirds of the teams found a positive result, found a relationship with darker skin tone and more likely to get a red card in soccer. And so there's substantial variability across the teams. Now we see variability like this in research, right? Lots of teams study problems in different ways and we would typically consider the meta-analytic result, the combination of these to be the most reliable estimate of the true effect 
to the extent there is a true effect. But the twist in this study was that they all used the same data set. So we gave them the research question, then we handed them the data to analyze that question, and this is the variation uh, that they came up with of testing the same question with the same data. But it's more than that. This is after a round of internal peer review. So their first phase is they tr figured out their analysis plan, got their results. We removed the results and then shared the analysis strategies across the teams for them to give each other feedback because it was a complex analysis choices to make. So they gave each other feedback. People could incorporate that feedback however they wanted. And then they submitted their final analysis plan uh, and outcomes. And this is the variation still after the chances to get some convergence. Uh, in their results. So the point for our purposes is that when we read a paper, the way it's read easily is that's what the data show. But of course that isn't correct. Right? That's what the data show contingent on the choices that I made in that analytic pipeline for how it is I drew inference from that data. And we don't represent the variation that may occur in how those choices may have impact on the outcomes that we observe. So we don't even know necessarily how much those choices, the findings we have, are contingent on those choices that we make. And that flexibility is unseen because it's possible we may unwittingly exploit it, depending on what stakes we have and what kind of outcome we want to observe if there's a desire to or observe a particular outcome. OK, that's one example. Second example uh, comes from work uh, by Ernest O'Boyle and his colleagues uh, from the uh, management literature. And they were interested in trying to figure out how is it that papers change over time or findings change over time over the sort of the life course of the research project. So this is a very hard thing to track because you can't see the things prior to the paper. But they came up with an ingenious solution to try to see how findings might shift over time. And what they did was they found 142 dissertations in the management literature where they could get access to the original dissertation that also had a publication of the same research. So they had the same project and two versions of it, what was reported in the dissertation and what was reported in the final paper. And they just compared them. And what they compared was what were the outcomes that were reported. So in dissertation, 45% of the hypotheses that were reported in the papers were significant. They found positive results. In the papers of the same research, 66% of the hypotheses were significant results. So something changed in the same research from what was reported in the dissertation to what appeared in the paper. So they unpacked that further by looking first at what tests were added to the paper that weren't in the dissertation or were removed from the dissertation that then didn't appear in the paper. And they found across the, uh, of the projects that 333 hypotheses were added to the publication that hadn't been in the dissertation. And 70% of those were significant. And then they also observed that there were 1,333 hypotheses removed from the dissertation for publication. And 38% of those were significant. So there's lots of reasons that things change between dissertations and papers. Dissertations are usually too long. Stuff has to come out. Uh, and there are choices to make about how it is we tell what we found in the paper versus what the or origins of the work were. Also, editors and reviewers contribute to saying, well, I'm not so interested in that. What about this? What about that? So we don't know from this work how it is these changed. All we know is that there was some systematicity in that change. Right? Pa findings that were significant were more likely to be added. Findings that were not significant were more likely to be removed. But they also looked at the same tests that were in the dissertation and the publication. Right? Same thing. There were 272 unsupported hypotheses in both, but 20% of them became significant in the publication when they weren't significant in the original research. But on the flip side, there were 373 hypotheses that were supported in both, uh, were supported in the dissertation, and less than 5% of those became unsupported in the final publication. So there's also a bias in effects becoming significant as they get into the publication that weren't because of some changes, and we don't know where they came from, in the analytic process, in the reporting process from dissertation to publication. 
So the upshot of this is that that final paper looks more significant, looks more positive, looks like they found more things than what was, under, what was actually in the data because of some selection process that brought out the positive results and suppressed the negative results, potentially exaggerating the evidence of those findings. Okay, one more example, and this comes from a work by Bob Kaplan and Veronica Irvin, who were interested in what's the impact of getting people to commit uh, on what their actual primary outcomes are, on what they observe on those outcomes. And so what they did was they looked at uh, some large clinical trials from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, one of the NIH institutes in the US. And they compared studies where you had to pre-register in advance. Pre-registration became necessary by law for these kinds of trials in 2000. So what happened with the trials that were done prior to 2000? They didn't have to say in advance what the primary outcome was compared to those that were done after the fact, uh, where you had to commit before you've seen the outcomes, what is our primary outcome? And their upshot finding is this, that the positive result rate dropped from 57% positive results of the studies prior to committing uh, to what the primary outcome was to 8% after you had to commit in advance, uh, which one is the primary outcome. So we have to be cautious with this for a couple of reasons. One is it's a small n study itself, uh, so there needs to be replicated. Uh, and they're conducting, as I understand it, a larger scale replication of this. Uh, and then the other is that it's not actually an experiment. People didn't get randomly assigned to have to commit in advance before or after. It was over time. So it's possible that after 2000, we ran out of things to discover uh, in this area of research. And so that's why there are no more, almost no more positive results. We can't rule that out as a possibility. But the other possibility is that if you have to say in advance, make a commitment, this is my primary outcome, then that gives no more flexibility. You don't have that discretion anymore for when you're confronted with the data for deciding, well, actually, th this one is our primary outcome, not that one. This is really the important finding. Uh, and then amplify that in the paper, thus potentially exaggerating the likelihood that that's actually there, taking advantage of noise. OK, so there are many other possibilities that we could review uh, for what are things that happen in practice that are challenges for the credibility of the literature. But across all of this evidence, what we have observed is that there's many opportunities for discretion. There's many opportunities that we may not realize that we're employing reasoning biases into how we treat the evidence that we're accruing. Uh, and when we try to reproduce the findings in the literature, they are harder to reproduce than we might expect. So if it is the case that we are exploiting this flexibility and exaggerating the apparent quality uh, of the findings, the apparent significance, the apparent effect sizes of those findings in the literature, then when we try to replicate them, only a small portion are uh, replicating and our effect sizes are dropping by half on average in most of these systematic studies. So what can we do to improve that? How is it that we can improve the credibility of the evidence if we've created a culture where we're valuing reporting of significant findings over reporting credible findings? Ultimately, we think the change that's needed is a simple change. Our changes in behavior that are fundamentally things that we know already, we've known for a long time in our schooling of how it is we can improve the credibility of our findings. And they are just these two things, show your work and share. So what we mean by show your work is that when I make a scientific claim to you, I show you the process of how I got there. Not just show you the paper at the end of my summary, what David Donahoe calls advertising for the research is a paper, but actually how it is I generated the data, what decision process and different things I might have tried along the way, what other things did I do that didn't make it into the paper but are relevant uh, for this research domain? If you can see that entire process, then it's easier for you to evaluate the credibility of the claims at the end. And if I know that you're going to see that process and the choices that I make, then I have an occasion to take some perspective. Would, how would someone else think about the decisions that I'm making here? Would they see these as damaging the credibility of the claims? And if they would, then maybe I would take a different strategy and how it is I pursue that evidence. And then by share, we mean make available the data, the materials, the code, all of the things that were done in that research 
so that someone else can more easily replicate it if they want to replicate it. They can easily reproduce the findings if they want to reanalyze it. Or they can scrutinize the choices that were made and see how robust those findings are to other scenarios and other choices. And then extend those findings in other applications that may not have been tested yet. So by making those commitments as clearly and as transparently as possible, what we enable, rather than telling people how they should do their research and make their claims, we enable them to do the research the way that they think is the most effective, and then allow what is the great promise of science to actually occur, which is self-correction. Right? We conceive of science as self-correcting. We know that lots of our claims are not going to turn out to be true because we're at the boundaries of knowledge, pushing them as far out as we can. But for that to work, the system, when we are all debating this, these ideas in the marketplace, the system needs the information of how is it that those claims were made. And if we don't have that information, if we only have how it is I think is what is I think is important to represent about my claims in the paper, then you can't effectively self-correct because you don't have the information that you need in order for that process to work. And so transparency is facilitating that self-correction process by making it possible for researchers to critique, to extend, to challenge, whatever it is that that marketplace of ideas will exchange. And all of the other practices that we might talk about or associate with open science are just mechanisms of methodology. How is it that we might improve our research practices when we make them transparent so that others find those claims to be more credible and that they are actually more credible and robust? Okay. So what I want to talk about for the rest of the time is how is it uh, that we can get there? How is it we can make a uh, shift a culture so that showing our work and sharing is more likely to occur and becomes a pervasive practice across the scientific community? And when we're thinking about changing a research culture, we can refer back to some of this classic work by Rogers about how technologies become adopted in communities. Right? The Diffusion of Innovation uh, is the classic book uh, by Rogers. And you might recognize these terms very well. Right? There are innovators who are at the front lines, the first people that see the possibility of this uh, new technology and so adopt it immediately just to try it out, see what happens. Those early adopters are convinced about the promise of that and so they're willing to get on board and suffer through the early days of technologies. And then that moves into as the technology shows that it's effective, people see that others are doing it, you get an early majority the late majority. And then, of course, there's always the laggards who are quite happy with the world as it is. And please don't ask me to change anything that I do, because I like how I do it right now. And you don't need to show me that new technology, because I'm not going to use it. Uh, so they bring up the rear. OK, so we think about the adoption of research practices in the same way. And we uh, think about the big picture strategy of changing a research culture with this pyramid. And it's a pyramid because effectiveness of the higher uh, changes depend on effectiveness at the lower elements of this. So at the base is infrastructure. We need tools. If we want people to adopt new behaviors, we need tools that make it possible for those behaviors to occur. If I can't do those behaviors anywhere, there's no way uh, that I will do them. But it's not sufficient for most to just make it possible to do it, especially with researchers that are already busy, already have a lot on their plate of things to do, if we provide them solutions that require more things for them to do, append it on the end of the research process, then they're very unlikely to do them because they already got plenty to do. So effective in solutions have to integrate with the life cycle that the researchers already have, the workflows of how it is they get their work done and how it is they pursue uh, their, their solutions. But just having those technologies available, even when they're easy, People look to others about how is it that I'm supposed to behave, how is it that people do their work in my field. And so communities play a very important role of making things normative, of making it explicit, making it visible that other people are doing these behaviors that might be behaviors that I should do as well. And so we set norms through our local communities in science of this is what people in my subdiscipline do and how it is they do it and how they do it well. And for some, we can add to that by instead of just saying this is what people do because it's the right thing to do, and in fact, it's in my interest to do these things because the rewards that I get from my institution, from my granting agency, from the publisher, 
are aligned with the behaviors uh, that we are trying to get people to do. Be more open, share your work, show your work. And then finally, uh, for many of these things, you need a, a policy. This, this is what you do now. If you want the money, these are the, these are the requirements to get the money. So do those things. But a key part of policy change is that if these other things aren't present, then policies are more likely to be perceived as bureaucratic burdens rather than part of promoting good practice. So if there isn't a good technology, if I don't see others doing it, if I don't see this as something that's relevant for the quality of my research, then I'm going to treat that policy as just the next form I have to fill out rather than facilitating the work that I'm trying to do and the success that I'm trying to have. So these are highly independent, interdependent parts of a change process. Now I want you to think back to that adoption curve from the innovators all the way through the laggards. And we can rotate it and impose it right back on uh, to this uh, pyramid like this. So for innovators, all we need to do, because they have vision, they see potential uh, in new technologies, all you need to do is make it possible. They're willing to suffer through the idiosyncrasies of new technologies because they're focused on the behavior itself. They value openness for openness sake. And they're willing to do it regardless because they see that as a way that the world can change. Likewise, early adopters, once a technology becomes relatively easy to use, they can integrate it into their workflows. That's enough. They don't need the rest of the community to do it because they see value in those behaviors themselves. They're not looking for what others are doing or what's valued for them to try it out and to do those new behaviors. And as you have that initial adoption of some minority of the research community, if you make that visible, if you can see that others in my community are doing this behavior that I didn't know other people do, but is aligned with my values, those values are already present for transparency in the community. If I see that others are doing those transparency behaviors, then those norms start to shift for that early majority. Many more people will say, oh, I can see that this is a behavior that people are doing. I am going to do it as well. And to really get that large majority in the middle of the bell curve to adopt, then make it rewarding. Find ways to integrate those behaviors into the key mechanisms of reward across the research community. And finally, those laggards, well, they'll do it if you say you have to, get, you have to do it to get the money. Then they'll do it. Uh, but they may not adopt it otherwise. So this is how we think about the adoption process. And I want to give a couple of examples of interventions at each of these levels of analysis uh, that are working together interdependently to try to shift how it is the culture uh, does these behaviors. So the first is, is two base levels, the technology levels. Uh, and most of what our organization does uh, is technology. So we have a staff of about 50, and about 2 thirds of that staff are the software development team who are building the open source, open science framework, or OSF. And the goal of the OSF, in terms of thinking about this culture change strategy, is to integrate with the researcher's workflow and provide support across the entire research life cycle. So the OSF does not demand that researchers make everything open. What it does is it tries to solve a problem that researchers have today that they can make use of the OSF to help solve. And that problem occurs for my lab as it does, I know, for many others, which is, I lose stuff for my own use all of the time. Right? Our data, our materials, our old experiments, we do not keep track of it well. A computer explodes, a lot of information explodes with it. A postdoc explodes, a lot of information goes with it. Right? And so as a consequence, we can't keep track of our own work, especially across many different collaborations and the ad hoc ways that each person uh, organizes uh, their materials and workflow. So the OSF tries to solve that problem. We should no longer lose anything we have for our own use because it's a cloud-based system that can archive everything that we do and help with collaborative management of teams that are distributed across places. So we all just add to our private projects. Here are the collaborators, all the data, all the materials, all the process uh, gets posted there. We can register the designs if we want to commit in advance what it is we're, uh, we're planning for the research to distinguish it from what we discover uh, as we do the work. Uh, and it helps facilitate that product process just among the collaborative team. But then what we do is with each project and each component of each project, there's a little button in the corner that says, do you want to make it public? 
And if you click it, it says, are you really sure you want to make this public? And if you say yes, then that part is public. So we integrate that private workflow for collaborative management with a public workflow for making these things available to others so that you can make as much of your process as transparent as you want or as that you can because of IP uh, or uh, sensitivity of data and otherwise as, as possible. And you can have controlled access. So you can say, I can't share this data with anybody. I can't make it public because it's sensitive data. But I'll make it so that other people can request it. And so you make it available as a controlled access. And then other people can say, here's my IRB, uh, human ethics, uh, that I can work with such data. And then you can navigate the data exchange. So the purpose is to make openness part of the research process, not an extra thing, and support the researcher life cycle as it happens. So you can go check it out. It's free to use. Uh, you can just go uh, and use it. Uh, but I won't say anything more about that part. Uh, oh, I guess I will say one more thing, which is to show adoption. Uh, and just by making tools like this available, there's enough interest in the community already that that adoption is accelerating at nonlinear rates. So we released the OSF in 2012. This is showing one uh, of these graphs, uh, the number of registrations, number of times that researchers created a project and then created a frozen version, usually right before they start data collection or analysis to say, this is what my commitments are in advance of observing the outcomes. Uh, any other figure that we show, whether it's users uh, or number of files or amount of data, they all look like this, uh, doubling essentially every year uh, since the ser service was launched. And ours is not the only service that provides such things. Others are showing uh, good growth rates as well, showing that those values are already present, that sometimes it's just a matter of making the tools available and providing other reasons to get involved uh, so that people will start to adopt these behaviors. OK. I also want to point out that we had a pre-registration challenge about, uh, about starting registration, of trying this out. And more than 500 universities participated. And you can see the number one university uh, of all of those uh, from the pre-reg challenge, uh, University of Queensland. Uh, beat Oxford and Stanford and UCL and Pennsylvania, Toronto, Duke. Uh, so this is just how many research teams entered a pre-registration for a new project. Uh, into this challenge and tried out some of these new behaviors to promote transparency. So there's a lot happening here uh, among your colleagues, a lot more than there is anywhere else. So feel good about that. That's all I got to say really about that. Okay, another uh, intervention. So how can we think about the existing reward system and nudge how it is that that system works to be more values aligned? so that we are promoting some of the rigor and transparency behaviors and commitments to minimize some of the discretion that we have at different phases. Register reports is one of these solutions. So here is the cartoon version of how publishing happens, right? We design a study, we collect and analyze data, we write the report, and then we publish it. Of course, it doesn't quite happen like that because there's this big barrier after the report called peer review uh, that is in my way of getting what I need, that publication. In this context, all of the incentives for that report are make it as beautiful as possible so that at the seventh or eighth or ninth journal that I submit the paper to, they eventually say, OK, fine, OK, just let it go. It can be published. Right. Register Reports makes one fundamental change to this process, and that is to move peer review to right after the design phase at the journal. So now to the journal, if I submit a register report, what I submit is here's my research question. Here's justification for why that question is important. Here's the methodology that I'm using to test that question. And maybe here are a few preliminary experiments or exploratory studies that I did to sort of help to show that there's something viable here, something worth testing. And then those critical tests, the reviewers evaluate, saying, is that an important question? Is that methodology a good test of that question? And if it passes those reviews, then you get in principle acceptance. Whatever the outcome, we will publish it as long as you follow through with the methodology that we've now agreed upon, showing that, in fact, you carried it out uh, in an effective way. And so here are some outcome independent criteria to show that you did the things that you said you were going to do and did them effectively. But regardless of outcome, we will publish it. So just this change fundamentally shifts some of the incentives for researchers in the publishing process. I still need the publication. We're not going to change those rewards very soon. But now, 
the kinds of ways that I get publications and register reports is more dependent, in fact, it's exclusively dependent, on asking important questions and proposing effective methodological tests of those questions. I don't know what the results are. The reviewers don't know what the results are. So we can't be biased by picking only positive results, picking only sexy results. What we can be biased by is, is the question important? And do we need to know the answer? Which is presumably what a lot of research process is about, is we need to find this out. We're not supposed to control the results. We control the designs and the methodologies and our ingenuity to test things. So with this shift now, my primary goal is to test the most important things, provide good preliminary evidence that it's worth testing, provide a compelling uh, rationale and methodology for testing it. Reviewers' uh, incentives also shift. When I'm a reviewer, at, when I see the entire report and all the outcomes, after checking how many times I was cited, the second thing I check is, are the findings consistent with my prior claims? Right? If they're consistent, then it's a great paper. We should publish this. It reinforces my point of view. If it's inconsistent with my prior claims, then I'm pretty sure I'll find some errors in the methodology that justify rejecting it. Right? So I have skin in the game as a reviewer and how it is I might engage uh, with uh, this research, even if I'm trying to be objective, even if I'm willing to entertain possibilities that are against my prior claims. But in this context with register reports, I don't know what the results are. I can't be biased by them. And so even if I have someone that has a completely different point of view than me in this particular research bo domain, both of us may come to agreement on the quality of this design and the quality of the methodology. And one of us may be particularly disappointed with the outcomes, but we don't know what the outcomes are. And so we can't be biased in that decision making. So there's a lot more that we can describe about this, but adoption of register reports has likewise been showing this nonlinear growth. Uh, as of yesterday, I think there are 170 journals that have adopted register reports as an option uh, for submissions. And the first adoption you could see in 2013, we published a special issue of the journal Social Psychology to demonstrate this, uh, the viability as proof of concept for this. And there are now, uh, I think, 150 or so published registered reports uh, that have finished and the final publication is out. So we have some initial things that we've learned about the process and about the outcomes that we can look at uh, for what registered reports are doing. Uh, and so far, the evidence is consistent with what we would expect this kind of commitment to achieve. The first is that it seems to be addressing publication bias quite effectively. So you might know that if you look at the literature uh, as it exists today, almost all of it is positive results. Depending on the subfield, between 80% and 95% of the results are positive results. We're just always really good at confirming our hypotheses. With registered reports, whether they are for novel studies testing new questions or for replication studies testing qu claims already made, uh, the negative result rate is almost about 60% on average. So more than half of the findings we're publishing with registered reports are negative results, uh, suggesting that there is substantial bias in what we end up publishing that gets left out uh, in the standard model. Now, that's important because just seeing that is evidence for many editors to say, and that's why I will never publish registered reports. Because if I publish a lot of negative results in my journal, then no one will read my journal, no one will cite the things in my journal, and I'll be the one that destroyed the impact factor of this journal. And that's not a legacy that I want for my journal. So it's a reasonable question, whether we agree with that logic or not, it's a reasonable question to ask is what's the impact on, at minimum, citations uh, for work that's published as registered reports compared to others? And so far, the evidence suggests that there is no citation reduction uh, for register reports compared to the other articles in those journals that published at the same time. If anything, there might be an improvement uh, increase in citations for those. Now, we don't know how robust this will be or if it will remain this way, uh, but I have a, my speculative interpretation is that when peer review is done before you know the results, it has a big benefit for the importance and the quality of that research. The quality because we critique the methods very closely. We're attending to that because that's all we have to attend to. And then the importance of the results because what we've agreed before knowing what the results are is that we really need to know these results. 
that this is important for advancing research, whether they are positive or negative. We're evaluating it with the possibility that they won't be, this relationship won't exist. Uh, and so as a consequence, those papers get more attention and interest because they are very high quality uh, and they are testing outcomes that we just wanted to know uh, what the answer was. Uh, that still is speculative because we don't know, but we have some more evaluation projects underway to try to see what is the impact of adopting register reports on the quality of evidence, the likely of these things, and whether it has other unintended consequences that we haven't yet anticipated. All right. So that is example two. I'll give one more example, and then we'll transition to closing and, and discussion. And that is, how is it that we can address this challenge of normative change? When there are people doing open science behaviors now, it's not obvious that others would observe that they're doing open science behaviors. And based on that pyramid, we really need evidence for ourselves that there are others in my community that do this thing. Many of the big barriers to adoption of a new behavior is nobody else does it, it must be too hard, uh, and so why would I spend time doing it? And so one of the solutions for that is obvious, is make it visible when there are others, whatever, however many there are, when there are others doing that behavior, so that I can see that in fact other people are doing it. That's not impossible to do. That it might be worth my while if I think it's of value. And so an easy way to do that is to signal that behavior when it occurs with things like badges. So a community of researchers develop these badges and the specifications. What does it mean to have open data for an article, open materials, or pre-registration? And so a journal can adopt those badges, and when your article is accepted at the journal, you can say, uh, the journal can ask, uh, we offer these badges for good practices. Uh, if you would like to get an open data badge, you just need to meet these criteria. And if you can meet them and you want to, uh, you get the badge and then a link to the data uh, on, in the article. So we might say, that, that's, that's silly. Badges, this is science. This isn't Girl Scouts. Uh, we don't care about badges. Badges are, are a stupid thing. Uh, but the obvious question to ask is, well, first, the obvious point is that it's not about the badges. It's about the behavior that the badges signal. And if those behaviors are desirable behaviors, if we see them as valued behaviors, then perhaps a simple act of signaling that I did that is enough to encourage me to do it. And even more importantly, my signaling that I did it might be important for others in my subdiscipline to say, oh, people do that. Maybe I'll do it too because it is something that I value. I don't have to convince people of a value, I just have to potentially convince them that in fact this is something that people do. So, of course, we need to evaluate whether that's effective. The first journal uh, that adopted badges was Psychological Science, and they did so on January 1st, 2014. What I'm showing you here on the y-axis is the percent of articles in Psych Science in black and four comparison journals in gray, uh, prior to adoption of badges by Psych Science, so in six month increments. So Psych Science had about 3% of their articles with open data uh, prior to adoption of badges. They adopt badges on January 1st, 2014, and the graph goes like this. So within 18 months, 39% of the articles in Psych Science had open data. No change in the comparison journals. Uh, this was first half of 2015. This year, 90% of the articles in psych science have open data. We have gone from near zero to almost all of them uh, within a five-year span. Uh, and that's not because the badges are super important. Right? All the badges are doing is providing signals that some people are doing this, and that's enough for a few more people to do it, which makes it enough for a few more people to do it, which makes everybody else realize, oh, this is an emerging norm. And that pretty soon, it becomes costly not to do it, because this is something that we value. And if everybody's doing it, then the question that gets asked is, why are you not doing it, rather than are you going to do that? And so with valued behaviors, it's not so hard to change that behavior if you can make it visible when people are doing it. And you can make it easy to do it. And you can provide the solutions to make it possible. And even better, if you can provide some reward uh, for doing it. Okay. So that's uh, that uh, model uh, back to the fore. Okay. Now I've emphasized, oh, I have, I have one more uh, illustration of just how these norms are changing. So Betsy Pollock and Ted Miguel and their colleagues did a survey of social behavioral sciences. So econ, 
uh, political science, sociology, and psychology to see when people report retrospectively, have you adopted any of these behaviors, open data, open materials, pre-registration, uh, when did you start to do that behavior? And, what, and they did a very a good uh, sampling effort of, of, on this. Uh, and what you see here is simply the cumulative plot of people saying that they've done at least one of those behaviors in black. So by 2017, 84% of their survey respondents across these four fields have said that they have done at least one of these behaviors. And you can see the individual behaviors uh, below that. And there's also variation across these fields in which of the behaviors have become more popular and when they became more popular. So for example, in economics, most of the leading journals now by routine require data sharing and sharing code. And so in economics, you see in the much earlier in this decade, a uh, rapid increase in code sharing and data sharing behaviors, uh, but not the same kind of increase in psychology and sociology, uh, which have, journals have not uh, generated yet strong uh, policies for those practices. Whereas on the other hand, most of that rise in pre-registration is occurring within psychology compared to the other fields, because this is a particular behavior that has become even mostly important. Uh, popular uh, within psychology with rapid onset. So among the psychologists surveyed, 40% of them by 2017 had pre-registered a study. Now, given the rates, it might be up past 50% by now. Uh, so these changes are happening, they're happening quickly. But to close, all of the examples that I've provided so far focus on a single point of entry of influence uh, of shaping the culture, and that's with journals. Uh, in sh shifting the behaviors of individual researchers. But as we know, the ecosystem around researchers has many different stakeholders that shape the behaviors, the culture, the incentives that drive that individual's behavior. Right? Each one of us has a unique institute, combination of institutions, publishers that we publish in, societies that we're members of, and funders that fund our work. And if all of those are not working in concert, then it can't, we can't effectively shape the entire culture. If one of them doesn't reinforce the right messages, then we provide some inhibition in allowing the values that we have to be expressed in daily practice. So the big challenge for culture change is, that, is the coordination problem. All of these are independent actors, and within them, there's lots and lots of independent actors, and we need them all to sort of nudge their incentives at the same time in order to reinforce each other's incentives in order to make it in our interest to live according to our values for our own career success. And so there's lots of different activities that we can discuss in Q&A about how each of these can play a role uh, and are playing roles uh, in advancing transparency and reproducibility of research. Uh, but for now, I will just stop. Uh, and if you would like these slides, just take a picture. There's a link to them at the bottom. And if you'd like inf more information about any of the things that I mentioned, uh, there are links there to get you more. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I really appreciate it all. So. Thanks, Brian. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions, uh, please come up to the microphones uh, and ask them. Um, to get started, uh, I think I'll ask um, one, you've, this is, this is great. Um, you've spent the last week in Australia. This is his first trip um, to Australia. Um, and touring around and interviewing, um, well, chatting with students, chatting with academics, um, but also uh, funders, um, policy makers, and uh, the chief scientist uh, of Australia and so on. What's your impression? I mean, how are we doing within uh, uh, you showed us a bit of evidence about how we're tracking as an institution in terms of pre-registrations and so on, but what's your impression of, of how we're going in Australia more generally? Uh, good question. And it's, it's hard to know the extent to which I get a biased sample because if people invite me, they may be inviting me because they're already invested in these issues. Uh, but because I've had a chance to go to a number of institutions, so this is my fourth institution on this trip, uh, and one more uh, still in Sydney. Uh, but, there, but across the board, there has been broad enthusiasm uh, from every stakeholder across every level for adoption of these practices uh, and new behaviors of shifting this culture. Uh, and that is very encouraging because the, the shared enthusiasm for that is the key initial place to start. Uh, 
And then the question is, what are people willing to do in order to actually adopt these behaviors and shift the internal cultures? Because the hardest change is within institutions uh, because there's so many different disciplines and so many different interests across those uh, that it's very hard uh, at an administrative level to have those practices get implemented and extended across the disciplinary boundaries because so much of our norms and practices are within our disciplinary domains. Uh, and so the conversations can be promoted at an institutional level from top, but a lot of the change is local within individual departments. Uh, and so to the extent that those changes are happening within these groups, it's because of groundswell work. People coming together saying, I'm interested in this. We're going to start a little course. We're going to do a little training together. We're going to all work on this particular problem. We're going to change our honors requirements uh, for students, whatever it is those kinds of individual behaviors have a rapid cumulative effect uh, for making it easier for institutional change uh, at the top. But across places that I've been um, just on this trip, that's universally occurring. Uh, I haven't, uh, as opposed to some prior trips in other places, haven't had people just say, no, we're, we're, we like our metrics. Uh, H-index is the way to go, uh, or whatever. You know, and they didn't exactly say that, but they effectively said that. Uh, and so this, is, this has not been that uh, at all. Oh, thanks, Brad. Yes, please. Is that working? OK. Um, thank you for your talk. It was really great. Um, I just had a sort of similar kind of cultural change question. Um, so I'm almost things. at the end of my PhD, and um, lots of the people here are PhD students as well. So I was just wondering how we might go about in the future reconciling this quality over quantity issue because a lot of us here will be starting doing um, pre-registrations and also uh, registered reports and some of my friends have done registered reports it takes a really long time and it's not necessarily the same kind of quick time frame and turnaround that we would normally have to get to a postdoc where people might want 10, 12 publications or whatever kind of extravagant number that they would want. So just wondering what we should be emphasizing this kind of quality science. Yeah. Know, yeah. OK, great question. So it's a, uh, if in case you couldn't hear that in the back, the question was a fundamentally about quality versus quantity. And how do we navigate that with the incentive systems as they currently exist as early career researchers particularly? Because some of these practices may be more work and may result in slower science compared to uh, the, the other ways uh, that we might do things that might allow us to get quantity but might not be as robust. So there's a few different answers uh, to that, uh, that. And so I'll sort of do it in this piecemeal. The first was specifically things like register reports. Well, register reports are going to take longer because we have to go through this whole peer review up front. Uh, and so that might slow us down in producing publishable outcomes. That might be true, but I think the early evidence suggests it's actually the opposite. Uh, so the advantage of registered reports uh, for speed uh, is that you know very early whether your paper is going to be accepted or not. And you can even put it on your CV, this is in principle accepted, before you've collected the data, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but the yield is also higher than the traditional review process. So as we do regular research, we do both kinds of research in my lab. Uh, the regular research at the outset has very uncertain yield. So we might do lots of different experiments. Some of them end up being publishable, some of them not. And so that takes time. And then also, the report itself has uncertain yield and lots of time, which is we send it to journal A, send it to journal A minus, send it to journal B plus, send it to journal B, until it finally, finally somewhere gets in. Right? And that takes a lot of time. The average publication rate for regular style reports with register reports is somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 percent of articles get accepted. So it's very common to have to go serially through many journals, which adds a lot of burden and time. With register reports, so far, the publication rate in those same journals is about 70 percent. So far. So, but if that holds, that higher yield means a lot less time having to go serially through multiple publications. So this is an extremely pragmatic argument on this, uh, on this point. The reason I think that it's a much higher yield is because in the regular model, 
when you identify as a reviewer fatal problems in my design, there's nothing I can do about it, right? You just identified the reason for it rejected, which I hope the next reviewers won't notice, uh, so it'll get through, right? Whatever it is. But there's nothing that can be done. When you identify a fatal flaw in my registered report design, you suggest a fix. And then I change the design to address the concern. And then it's still a viable project. And so there ends up being a much more collaborative exchange between reviewers and editors and the authors for trying to make these into viable, interesting projects. And most of our ideas are interesting in some way. And the reviewers, as experts in that domain, can help build an interesting case. And so it might be more time just for that individual review process. But I think there's actually higher yield total and perhaps higher quality yield, which is the promise of register reports. So that's a super sort of at the base pragmatic answer. Another answer at the totally other end is what are people hiring actually looking for? And it may be true that there are people that are looking for quantity. The perception is there that that's what matters, right? Is we need to produce quantity. When I went up for tenure, uh, I told this story earlier, when I went up for tenure, uh, and then again up for full professor just a few summers ago, the administrator of my department said, okay, please print out all your papers uh, and submit them for the committee to review. I had been, you know, going up for full professor in the US is going up 10 years after a PhD or 10 years after starting your faculty position. So I had 100 papers. So printing them out, first of all, that's stupid. Uh, but printing them all out, that's really stupid. Right? So what ha would, have they communicated to me? They've communicated to me that volume matters, that they, they tenure by weight. Uh, and so they will put them on a scale, say, oh, yep, you got enough, uh, and then I get tenure. But of course they don't mean that. Right? I have observed the evaluation promotion process in my department. Uh, my spouse was at the dean's level committee uh, and talks about the rigor that that committee goes through as it goes through the stages for advancement. And in those committees, we're not weighing the papers. It's a very rigorous kind of evaluation. But they're, what they're communicating is the wrong thing to how it is I get advanced. And so I think, and this is now speculative, I think that the reality of evaluation is much more about quality than what we perceive it as. We just don't have the evidence and the communication is off target. And so what we could improve is how it is we communicate what is the actual basis of evaluation and then show the evidence that that is in fact the basis of evaluation. That if you do want to just count by numbers, then say it. This is a postdoc where you, the person with the most publications wins. No one is going to put that ad up. Uh, but they might be influenced unknowingly by numbers. And so we should be studying whether that occurs. And so there's simple messaging that might change. right? If my department had instead said, when you come up for tenure six years from now, you're going to submit three papers. You pick what they are, and they, the committee is going to read those three papers and evaluate the quality of your work based on those three papers. If that was what the message was to me at the outset, it would have totally changed my mindset about what it means to succeed in this environment. It's not about volume, because I'm not going to give them everything. I'm going to give them three. So I'm going to make sure that I have three great ones. Of course, I'm going to try to do more things, and I know that not everything will hit. Uh, so I will do more work. But I need to have some quality work. So I think there's a messaging problem, a lack of data for what actually is rewarded, and more potential for us to communicate our values in how it is we reward and incentivize so that we don't feel that conflict. That really, what you're trying to do every day, early in your career and late, is do the best work you can. And that's it. That should be where it stops. So, thanks for that question. Yeah. Um, thank you. Nice job. Um, yeah. <laughs> where I've ultimately had my paper rejected four times and the conclusion has been the same every time, where it's, they like the research question, they love the method, but the results are a little bit messier than they want, so it's been rejected. And it's ultimately come to that conclusion four times over. And I guess what my question is, is with the open science movement, do you see it shifting towards holding reviewers and editors and journals accountable for those sorts of decisions, or just relying on a general social change and environmental change where reviewers are just basing it on different decisions? 
Yeah, it's a great question, and it's a challenge that will be the longest uh, running challenge, I think, uh, for how publication decisions get made. Because there's good reasons to like when it all fits together and it's all beautiful. And some of our submissions still look like that. Uh, and so reporting the reality as it is, it, you know, the messiness is dissatisfying because we want certainty. We want cleanliness. Those things are good in the abstract sense, regardless of what reality in doing the science provides. Uh, and so that is a reasoning barrier that it, we're not easily going to escape from reviewers and editors. But even in the standard reports process, there is opportunity to address some of the points that you make. So register reports would be great if you hadn't done the research already. Right? You submit, you don't know what the results are. If they're going to pay exceptions, fine, that happens. A, a, a sister model is results blind review. So there are a few journals, not a lot, but there are a few that have adopted the option to submit your methodology results blind. This is how we're going to report it, but you just leave out the actual findings. From what you describe, your per paper is a perfect candidate for that, right? Yeah, the results do have exceptions and things that don't quite fit. But if everyone agrees the methodology is good, the question's important, then people may be much more likely to agree, yeah, let's take it. And then the results are all messy, and they say, ah, I don't understand what's happening. And well, yeah, welcome to science. That's how it works. Uh, and so those, I think, are the only mechanisms we currently have available for that. The other uh, journal strategy that has emerged, and some journals are trying to be rigorous on this, uh, is evaluate based on the quality of the methods, not on the importance of the outcomes, like PLOS One uh, has this as a publishing model. But even there, the accountability part, uh, as you say, the reviewers and the editors may not subscribe to that or may forget that that's the principle, or may just so much want that thing to make sense and for it to all fit together that they still say, uh, I'm not excited because of the messiness in the methods. Uh, or please just leave out those messy parts. Just show me the good parts, which is an even harder situation. Do you want the publication? You're gonna drop that stuff. Mm, that's a hard one. So no easy solutions there, but I think we are making progress over time uh, in trying to address it with other solutions. So thanks for that question. Yeah. Um, it's actually quite complicated, and there are lots and lots and lots of researchers, de degrees in freedom, things like that, that people don't even realize they are doing um, when they are making decisions that they may not be reporting and things like that. So do you find that that kind of a approach of, of likening it to, to kindergartens or whatever sometimes may backfire as come across as sort of condescending and not willing to engage with the reality of how difficult research is? Yeah, great point. So the, it is definitely an onboarding strategy to say, look, we, we understand these principles as very simple principles. And the principles are very simple. But the reality of implementation, as you describe, is far from that, uh, particularly with complex research studies and particularly with the actual process, how it is we make our decisions and translate that into making it evident in our behavior. So one of the key things that I think is a real barrier to adoption of open science practices is presenting it as all or none. Right? You're either in or you're out. Are you an open scientist? And you know, besides that, treating it as an identity rather than as good methodology. Uh, so that, I think, is, is as you describe it, that's a potential barrier. If people see this as, oh, it's supposed to be simple. It doesn't feel simple. I don't know where to start. I don't know how to start. I'm not going to do it right now. Right? It's a good way to create barriers to entry for that. So the key that we try to communicate, and perhaps the kindergartner example doesn't help meet that, uh, is incrementalism. Is how is it that you can do something a little bit better today in your methodology than you did yesterday? And we always know that we can do better in our methodology. We know that there are research design things that are, we don't have sufficient training on. We know that there are statistical practices that we can do better than what we understood before. 
And so open science behaviors really fit into that. They're methods. They're about how to do good methodology. It's not identity. And so for that, then, we can get people to onboard in simple ways. So for example, my lab started pre-registering in 2011, because everybody had to, because I said so. Uh, and, but what we started with was, we've never done this before. We don't know how to do it well. What should we do to start pre-registering? Because we want to start now. We're ready. And so what we did first was in that final planning meeting where we're having the lab meeting or discussion where we're deciding what's the design, what's the question we're going to test, we take notes. Let's register those notes. That's it. Let's just start with that. We wrote that down. That's easy. We'll put that up. And so then we did that. And then the next time we analyze in the day, we say, oh, we never decided what our exclusion rules are. We should do that next time. And so that iterativeness, the recognition that putting those notes up is better than what we did before, which is not have any notes up at all, no commitments. OK, we're doing a little bit better than we did before. OK, now we add a little bit more. Now we add a little bit more. So it is not an all or none, doing this or not, an identity or a non-identity. It is good methodology, just like trying to improve statistical practice and everything else. And so to the extent that we can help with onboarding, it's to provide those mechanisms for incrementalism, that it's really just about step-by-step -step improvement. So I appreciate the comment on that. Thanks very much for the question. Yes? Um, I just have uh, two questions, I guess. Uh, issues that I wonder if you have the ideas how to address, or are they being addressed in, uh, possibly in ways that you didn't have time to talk about? First one is that um, it's true that a lot of the research degrees of freedom come into play in the choice of how you analyze your data, but there's also a lot in terms of which data you analyze. You've got several outcome variables. You pick the one that's favorable. And um, when I, on occasion, uh, actually tried to go download the data associated with papers, it's pretty clear that what is posted is just barely enough to replicate what is reported in the paper, as opposed to fully including everything that's relevant to the question. Um, I don't know how you deal with that or how much that's undermining the value of the, the data sharing. Um, how do we deal with this? Is there anything from the ground up that can be done? Yes. OK, good question. So let me take the second one first, because I have it in mind. And then you'll remind me of the first question. Uh, so uh, on adoption of register reports, the, you know, the, the uh, impact factor or prestige of the journal still matters. Uh, whether it's reality or not, that still matters in how people make decisions. And so with these innovations, like register reports and otherwise, uh, we have made a particular effort to try to make inroads into some of the more prominent journals within different disciplines to see if we can get adoption. So another option uh, for economics is uh, Nature Human Behavior, which has adopted registered reports and is for all social behavioral sciences. Uh, that doesn't solve the top five, uh, but we haven't gotten in the top five yet. So the other thing that we're doing is grassroots campaigns to have people within a subdiscipline send notes, talk to editors uh, in the particular journals that they think would help with adoption uh, within their subfield. Uh, and we've had a good deal of success in different subfields with that. So if that's of interest to you or anybody, you can just email me or go to the Registered Reports website. And there is a community of practice that has developed templates of letters to send uh, to editors. Uh, and then sharing of information of what's working, what's not working, who's tried this journal, who seems most open on the editorial board to go with next. Uh, so there's a lot of, of work happening to try to get adoption in areas where then it becomes more viable over time. So that's the answer to that. Uh, first question was about uh, incompleteness of data sharing uh, and other degrees of freedom. I remembered it myself. This is great. Uh, and, uh, and how that might undermine the effectiveness of some of these. So there are a couple of important points uh, that you make in that. Uh, one is that uh, the behaviors themselves are not done perfectly. So related to the incrementalism point, there is a sense of, well, they got a badge, but they really didn't do what I would expect that would allow make that badge meaningful. Right? They, yeah, they shared the data, but the code book's terrible. Uh, and I can't parse it. Or there might be variables that are relevant but are missing, but are relevant for reproducing the findings. So like incrementalism on adopting behaviors, our overall strategy is recognition that a lot of these behaviors are skills. Pre-registering well is a skill. It took us a long time to get good at it and then develop templates to try to help others get good at it faster. 
Uh, and so because of that, there is going to be a lot of slop in the system initially. But our first goal is get people to do the behavior, then get them to do it well. Because if we set the bar so high that in order for you to get this acknowledgement of having open data, you have to meet all of these crazy criteria that take months to do, then no one's going to adopt it. So there is a pragmatism of let's get people on board with the behaviors and then incrementally incentivize and improve those behaviors as people learn how to do it better. But what it raises is the, exactly the issue that you mentioned, which is it doesn't then guarantee the reliability of the findings. Right? If I still took advantage of a lot of degrees of freedom in what I analyzed, and I only share the subset of data that allows you to reproduce the way I analyzed it, then that doesn't effectively address all of the challenges for, uh, for the confirmatory nature of those tests. Uh, and yeah, that's how it is. Uh, we aren't going to get to certainty uh, for a very, very long time. And we're never going to get to certainty on any individual claim associated with any individual study. So as we improve, what we will see is the deficiency in how we approved. And as long as we adopt a mindset of incrementalism, of constant improvement, then we, part of the critique of papers will be, it's great that you shared those. I'm able to reproduce your findings, but I'm not able to reproduce your process. How did you select those outcomes as opposed to other outcomes? And so that's what I need to see from you next time in order to be more, find your, your claims even more credible. And so the, the critique process will mature, but now we'll be at a shared basis of, yeah, we should be sharing this. And that's a great place to start from in order to make those additional arguments more credible over time. But the, these are real challenging things. And the point is that we will never end. There isn't a, okay, now we're open science and we're done. Uh, this is just like every other part of science is, now we're doing a little better before, and we still have more to do to do even better. And we'll always be on that path. So thanks for that question and comment. Thanks.